USS Etzel was, in most respects, not a special ship. One of many, many four-stacker destroyers built during and immediately after the Great War. She was just a single ship in a grouping of three classes that, as the unified flush decker type, came out to 273 in all. Even her own class, the Clemson, was no less than 156 strong. With the end of World War I, the general drawdowns in navies across the world, and the sheer number of these ships, it should come as little surprise that relatively few of them ever saw actual frontline combat service. Not even once World War II kicked off. Most were used for more second-line kind of duties. Convoy escort, conversion to transports, mine sweeping or mine laying. Many of these ships would, as a result, be forgotten even to those who study history, as they did little of real note in comparison to newer destroyers. Valuable work, to be sure, but not the attention-grabbing kind. This is not to say all of them were forgotten, of course. Etzel was not one of those ships. She could have been, but her fate is a sad one, and one that keeps her name in the minds of those who study World War II naval history. A heroic tale of a doomed last stand. A tragic end to her crew, even those who found rescue in the hands of the Japanese. A story that deserves to be remembered, even in a time of great tragedy across the Pacific. And a story that is all too often forgotten in pop history, as is the case with many of the tales of heroism and dogged determination against overwhelming odds in the Java Sea campaign. The model I will be using periodically in this video is just a simple one I put together for the video. For demonstration purposes, because pictures of Etzel are understandably rare. Her story begins the same as any ship. Laid down on September 15, 1919, launched on July 29th of 1920. She would commission into proper service on November 26th of the same year. Etzel was powered by four boilers, driving her through the water with around 27,000 horsepower. This could get her up to a speed of 35 knots, that speed being one of the defining features of the four stacker destroyers. The four boilers, for their part, being the main defining feature. Each boiler had one stack. Armed with four four-inch guns, one on the bow and stern, two on either wing behind the bridge, and twelve torpedo tubes, four triple mounts, two on either side, she was actually relatively heavily armed for her age. A single three-inch anti-aircraft gun of dubious utility, some depth charges, and the odd machine gun would round out her armament. She would end up being one of the few four stackers to retain her original armament throughout her entire service life, for a reason we'll soon get into. Etzel's initial service was actually fairly eventful for a destroyer of her type. Shortly after she entered service, she was dispatched as part of the American Naval Squadron in Turkish waters, following the end of World War I. In so doing, she would have served alongside Arizona and several of her sister ships. The mission of this detachment was to secure American interests and help alleviate the issues with famine and refugees in Eastern Europe. In this, Etzel would serve well. She helped evacuate many people from war zones, particularly Turkey, where much of the Greek population fled in the wake of the Greco-Turkish War. She spent a fair bit of time doing this, visiting ports up and down the region from Russia to Egypt. It was only in 1924 that she returned to the United States for a much-needed overhaul. Following this, Etzel would join the Asiatic fleet in 1925, where she would serve for the rest of her career. For nearly 20 years, she was in the Philippines, sailing around between those islands and various Asian countries. This service would keep her from the refits and change of role that many of her sisters, and cousins in the Wicks class, would receive. When the war did come, Etzel was part of a division with several of her sister ships. These worn-out old four-stackers were dispatched on November 25th of 1941 to Borneo. This was two days ahead of the war warning issued in acknowledgement of the very real risk of Japanese attack. In common with various other moves that the Asiatic Fleet's commanding officer, Thomas Hart, did to preserve his outdated and outnumbered command in the event of war. As for Etzel, she and her sister ships, Whipple, Alden, John D. Edwards, were en route to Batavia in Java when Pearl Harbor was attacked immediately ordered to switch directions to Singapore to join the British Force Sea, 
the destroyers would arrive too late to do much more than search for survivors. Not that they would have helped much, even had they arrived, as none of them had much to speak of in regards to anti-aircraft firepower. For her part, during this process, Edsel would capture a Japanese fishing trawler, the Kofuku Maru, that would be handed over to the Australians and recommissioned as MV Crate. She would have a long and distinguished career serving the Australian Special Forces, and, in fact, is still around today as a museum ship. Edsel would not be so fortunate. Her initial career in the Java Sea was relatively calm in comparison to a lot of ships in that theater. She spent most of her time escorting convoys or larger warships. The most exciting things to happen to her during this period of the war would be anti-submarine work. She and her sister Alden, in escorting the oiler USS Trinity on January 20th, 1942, conducted a depth charge attack on the submarine I-123 after she fired on the oiler. This they would prove unsuccessful in, though the submarine also failed to do any damage. Later that day, though, Edsel would be the first American destroyer to assist in the sinking of a full-size enemy submarine, Ward naturally claiming first blood with her mini-sub sinking at Pearl Harbor. This submarine was the I-124, and three Australian corvettes, alongside Edsel and Alden, sank her off the coast of Darwin. Three days later, though, Edsel would suffer the ironic fate, in light of her actions against those submarines, of one of her own depth charges damaging her. Exploding beneath her stern in shallow water, it so badly damaged her stern that in spite of rush repairs in Java, she could only manage 30 knots at best afterwards. This would come back to haunt her later. Following this, Edsel and another of her sisters, Whipple, would be dispatched to provide anti-submarine escort for USS Langley as she attempted to run P-40s to Java. This story has been covered in Langley's own video, and I will likely do a more detailed breakdown of that tragedy of unforced errors at a later date. Suffice it to say that Edsel and Whipple, still armed with nothing more than the old and nearly useless 3-inch gun and some machine guns, could not protect Langley from the actual threat, aircraft. When Langley had to be abandoned after the air attack that doomed her, Edsel would pick up 177 survivors and vacate the area with Whipple. Two days later, those survivors, the crew of Langley at any rate, would be transferred to the oiler Picos on March 1st. Whipple would depart to escort another ship, Picos would sail with assorted survivors to Australia, and Edsel would set off toward Java once more. Aboard her were Army Air Force pilots and ground crew. Sources conflict on exactly what these poor souls were expected to do on Java, with the Japanese advancing as they were. Perhaps they were meant to fly and support the P-40s that actually made it to the island. Perhaps they were to be pressed in as impromptu infantrymen. Maybe no one knew at all, and it was an order sent in the chaos and confusion of those final days defending the East Indies. It's impossible to know for reasons that will soon become apparent. Etzel, after all, never made it to Java. It is here, leaving behind Picos, that she leaves all American records. Her fate wouldn't be known until a decade later, and even then the details would take many more years to come to light. Everything we know about her last day comes from Japanese records, fragmentary and potentially misremembered as they are. It is a story of heroism and determination, but one that can only ever have one ending. This is that story. What we can say for sure is that, as the Japanese were coming off the target practice of sinking the unfortunate Picos on March 1st, they detected what was reported as a light cruiser racing into the area. This was a common misidentification of four stacker destroyers, as their silhouette is similar to a smaller version of the Omaha-class cruisers. The Japanese would turn their forces to engage this contact, creating one of the most lopsided engagements in World War II. It would have been such even had the ship actually been in Omaha. The force in question was, after all, the Kido Butai the premier striking force in the Imperial Japanese Navy. The ships and crews that had hit Pearl Harbor and had, in the time since, been rampaging through the Pacific. These were the best men in the Japanese fleet, experienced and very good at their job. The same men who had pound Allied shipping and bases as far as Ceylon, and who seemed utterly unstoppable at this point in the war. 
In this case, there were the two heavy cruisers of the Tone class, Tone and Chikuma, two of the Congo class, Ye and Kirishima, a light cruiser, and eight destroyers. All of which, even the destroyers, could have very easily handled any four stacker on their own. And, of course, four of the Pearl Harbor carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu, and Soryu. This was a force that would have smacked the Allied forces in the Java Sea, at their height, around with little trouble. Into this raced Etzel. While we do not, and likely never will, know why she was in the area, the simplest answer is that she had picked up the distress call from Picos and was racing to pick up survivors, some of whom she had already fished out of the water once before. She was certainly, at minimum, following the evacuation order from Java that had gone out by this point. By the time it was apparent the Japanese were much closer than expected, it would have been far too late to withdraw. Etzel was, one should recall, still damaged from her own depth charge. While she could outrun the Congos, she could not outrun the Tones, even if she had not been damaged. And she certainly could not outrun the planes of the carriers. As such, at 5.33pm, Chikuma opened fire on Etzel, at this point still thinking she was a light cruiser. It is apparent from the Japanese accounts that Etzel's commander, Joshua Nix, knew he couldn't escape easily. He could attempt to flee, he could attempt to fight, but he couldn't hope to make a quick escape. So he didn't. He fought his old ship well. Thus would begin, as the cruisers charged the destroyer, two hours of one old, already damaged destroyer, embarrassing the pride of Japan's navy. Etzel would immediately begin laying smoke screens, the classic destroyer tactic to avoid fire from larger ships. She would lay smoke, use it, and then lay more when exposed. And when exposed, Nix would prove himself to be a truly masterful ship handler. Etzel would dance around the water, dodging every shell flung her way. With the distance giving more than enough time between shell flashes and the shells landing, he would turn into the splashes and dodge the corrected fire. He varied speeds from nearly full to nearly a stop. He turned his ship around from as little as a few degrees to a full 360 degree rotation. Nix would steer Etzel as if she were a modern sports car, not an antique destroyer already lamed by her own weapons. As one of Chikuma's crew described it, this enemy ship was extremely maneuverable and repeated changing speeds and courses and ran away like a Japanese dancing mouse. These wild maneuvers and smokescreens allowed Etzel to dodge every single shell from the heavy cruisers, making a mockery of their attempts to hit her. It reached the point that, after moving to block Etzel's retreat, the Congos had to join in to assist their erstwhile escorts. 14 and 6 inch shells began raining down around Etzel, and yet still the Japanese proved themselves incapable of hitting this one destroyer. Hiei straddled her, yes but it did no apparent damage. Even using flow planes to correct the fall of shot did nothing. The Japanese evidently grew so very frustrated by Etzel that Admiral Mikawa aboard Hiei ordered a charge on Etzel at 5.50 p.m. Etzel obliged. Nix charged at the Japanese, four-inch guns blazing the entire time. His target was apparently Chikuma, though all the shells fell well short. And, as the Taffies would later demonstrate, even 5-inch destroyer guns would struggle to do meaningful damage to a Japanese heavy cruiser. 4-inch might as well have been throwing rocks at it. However, reports from Chikuma indicate that torpedoes sailed through the water past their ship, so there seemed to have been a method to Nix's madness, even if it amounted to nothing more than forcing Chikuma to break off. Edsel did the same. Mikawa's somewhat reckless and frustrated charge did bringing the Japanese close enough that a shell hit on Etzel was reported from Tone, not Shikuma, at 6.35. This hit did no apparent damage as Etzel ducked into a squall, and when she was forced out of that, she promptly vanished into another smokescreen. For those keeping track, we're at over an hour of the best sailors Japan had to offer, proving unable to meaningfully damage a single destroyer. It fired over 1,000 shells by this point, for one hit that did no immediately apparent damage, on a ship that they outmassed by an order of magnitude, just in one of the cruisers, forget the battle cruisers, or battleships depending on what you call them. Admiral Nagumo, reportedly absolutely furious by this point, sent his planes out to finish what the guns couldn't. 
Again, reports differ on which carrier sent the planes out, some saying Akagi and Soryu, others saying every ship but Akagi. What is agreed upon is that over a dozen D-3A Val dive bombers descended upon Etzel. Again, sources disagree on how many bombs actually hit. Suffice it to say that Edsel was left ablaze and dead in the water. Her smoke screens proved ineffective at stopping dive bomber attack. And yet, the Japanese report that Nix turned his ship towards them, bow on, before she came to a halt. Was this from the damage forcing her to circle back, or a last act of defiance? Many choose to believe the latter. Regardless, with no power left and ablaze with fire, Nix seems to have given the order to abandon ship. The Japanese cruisers had closed in and pounded Etzel with their 5-inch secondaries, blowing her stern away and presenting us with the one, confirmed, picture of her sinking. A somewhat famous picture for all the blurriness of it. Taken from a 90-second reel shot by a crewman on Tone that I've only ever found bits and pieces of in spite of searching for it. As the crew abandoned ship and the Japanese continued to pound her broken hulk, Japanese lookouts reported what seemed to be her captain organizing the evacuation. Before he returned to her bridge and was never seen again. It would seem that Nix chose to go down with his ship after all they had been through together. The rest of Etzel's surviving crew, meanwhile, had evacuated into boats and rafts as their ship, still under fire it should be noted, slowly slipped beneath the waves. By 7 p.m., the brave USS Etzel was gone, leaving her crew floating in the water around where she had been. Chikuma would pick up between five to eight of those crew, or perhaps a mix of crew and army personnel, before a supposed submarine alert prompted her to abandon the rest to their fate. If this alert actually happened or not, who knows? What is for sure is that the men left behind would all perish, be it to starvation, dehydration, or sharks. Sad to say, though, that their crewmates would not be seeing a better fate. While all accounts are that they were treated well aboard Shikuma herself, this being early in the war before hate had fully settled in on the Japanese side, it was not the safe haven they could have hoped for. Because, after they were dropped off at a Japanese prisoner of war camp, that would change. This would be where they left official Japanese records as well. Only being discovered many years later, decapitated in a mass grave. A far too common fate for prisoners of the Japanese. And that is how the story of Etzel ends. A single old destroyer, crippled by her own weapons, that through amazing ship handling, embarrassed the very pride of the Japanese Navy for nearly two hours. She dodged fire from some of the best crews in that fleet, only taking one hit that didn't even slow her down. It would only be when dive bombers were called in that she was finally taken down. And even then, she made them work for it only for the few survivors pulled from the water to still be murdered ashore and their bodies thrown into a pit with other victims of the Japanese army. It is a shame she doesn't come up more often in discussions of Brave Last Stands, that Nix never received any medals for his ship handling, as none knew the fate of his ship for so many years. Overshadowed by the likes of Glowworm against Hipper, or the Taffies against the Japanese later in the war. Not to take away from any of those, but the fact still remains. Etzel stood alone against the best Japan had when they were still the unstoppable force steamrolling across the Pacific and embarrassed them and made them work to sink her. Not many can say they had a braver final stand. A final postscript here. Elron Hubbard, known variously for his bizarre, and often creepy in a not-so-good way, science fiction, or as the founder of the Church of Scientology, claimed to be aboard Etzel during that final battle, that he swam to shore and survived until rescue in the jungles. This is a bold-faced lie. Not only did he make the claim this is where he was during Pearl Harbor, which is patently impossible timeline-wise, there are existing records showing he was nowhere near the Pacific at the time. Harbor's claims are an insult to the men who actually fought and died in that last stand. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, make sure to like and subscribe and keep an eye out for the next one.